evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study at Ascent Bible Church. Uh, good to see some faces out in the crowd. Obviously, I cannot see faces out there for those that might be online, but it's good to um, be together again for another Wednesday Night Bible Study. We do have uh, another really awesome question. This question was posed to us actually a couple weeks ago uh, by Steve Romero. Um, he obviously got with Donna, and they hashed things out, I'm sure. So if it sounds kind of uh, convoluted or con uh, confusing, you'll know where it all came from. But anyway, uh, that said, it's actually a really good question. i um, looking forward to some of the discussion. Um, again, um, just want to welcome each and every one of you. Before we kind of lay out and discuss and spend a few minutes with ground rules, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get going with Bible study tonight. Lord, we just... Again, thank you so much for bringing us together uh, tonight, Lord. I just pray that as we open your word again, that you would uh, be make us mindful, Lord, of who you are in our lives, of how it is that you work in our lives, and this incredible plan that we see in your word, Lord, coming to pass, coming to fruition. And Lord, I'm just so grateful for allowing us the privilege to be a part of that plan as you continue to reveal, reveal it to us through your word. Um, through how it is that uh, you put your word together so that we can first and foremost know you, Lord, and also, Lord, be a part of your plan and your purpose for our lives. Thank you for everybody here, Lord. I thank you for those that will be joining us online. I, again, I just pray that your spirit would, uh, would teach us, would guide us, would lead us, and, um, Lord, reveal to us um, all truth as you promised in John 16. Thank you, Lord, again for tonight. Uh, be with us, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, everyone, good to see you. Again, just a few quick uh, ground rules. Go ahead and pull out your your How to Study the Bible booklets, because we're going to look at a couple of principles that uh, will guide some of our discussion, some of our teaching tonight. Uh, those of you that don't have one, I think we have a few more in the office. Do we not, Sylvia? We're Sylvia. There's Sylvia. Larry's, okay, they're not put together, right? No problem. Um, I just wasn't sure if everybody, does everybody have one? Louie, you probably have five, right? Three or four in your trunk. If you have one, just go grab one from the, under your seat in your car. Um, but um, anyway, good to see everybody. This booklet is really key because in it we've provided, we provide a lot of little diagrams and, 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 um, and tables to help uh, reveal to us some things that are in the Bible. Uh, and are about the Bible, but really the heart of this little booklet are the principles that are found in on page number three, which we often refer to as the principles of Bible study. There are 15 of them, and um, why I always point you to this booklet and the principles of Bible study is so that we can allow the scriptures, as you'll see again tonight, hopefully, uh, like we do every Wednesday night, allow the Word of God just to interpret itself. You know, again, one of the things that the Apostle Paul did in Timothy, Timothy's life, besides teaching him the Word of God, besides leading him to Jesus and, and, um, and allowing him to be used in that young man's life, is he challenged him. He challenged him in a number of ways. And I think one of the most profound verses, and it's a verse that we have adopted for our Discipleship uh, 3 material, which is how to study the Bible, is 2 Timothy 2.15. So if you want to turn there real quick, I just want to, by way of, by way of introduction and overview, um, reinforce and impart this verse to you because it really drives home um, what our Wednesday nights are about, especially um, as we look at um, studying the Bible. This is why we call this Bible study. Uh, the principles are key. And he says this to him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, numbers, verse number 15. He says, Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. Um, a very, very profound verse, very key verse. Um, and then he goes on, he says, that needeth not to be ashamed. And why is that thought thrown in that verse? Because if you remember from a few weeks ago, everybody in this room, that has accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Those of you that are online, if you are, um, if you are a child of God, if you are, if, if you have 
uh, embraced and you have received that gift of salvation, you will stand before him someday, each and every one of us is in what we know as the judgment seat of Christ, giving an, giving an account of this one life that God gave us on this planet after he saved us. And it's, what do we do with this? Uh, we were talking about that. And I think, no, it was at a funeral service last Friday where we were looking at some of Solomon's writings in the Old Testament and we were talking about origin, meaning, and destiny. Uh, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? When we talk about why we're here, you know, you need to understand, we need to realize that God left you here after he saved you for a purpose. And he's got a purpose for each and every one of us. And uh, we'll give an account, uh, not for uh, not for your soul. That was handled at the cross when he saved you. Uh, but what you did with this life, um, once you accepted him as your savior, uh, where Paul likens this life, not just of that of being a, of the child of a king, but also of that of being of a servant, right? When we stand before him, um, there's different folks in here that have different professions or vocations, but when we stand before the Lord one day, he's going to ask a question or he's going to point out whether or not we were faithful what? Servants. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful. He's not going to ask, say, pastor or teacher or accountant. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful what? Servants. So that is the challenge. That is the issue. So he says to Timothy in that verse, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show us how for a workman of God that needeth not to be ashamed. And then he closes the verse with a very significant thought or truth. He says, rightly, what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. So in that verse, the implication is, it's not even an implication, it's explicit. The Bible has some divisions in it. And this is where the principles of Bible study come in. This is why we have to know these and they have to be second nature whenever we're even just reading the Word of God. That um, you're thinking about historical, doctrinal, inspirational application. Who's this written to? The Jews, the Gentiles, the church. Because all these principles together um, help us establish the context. And as I was sharing with Marvin earlier and a young man that I'm discipling, Jacob Martinez, what's really cool, the Bible begins to pop. It just begins to come, become three-dimensional as you get into it. And I know some of us, when we're first learning the Bible or we're first being exposed to God's Word, um, it could be somewhat overwhelming or even tedious, if you will. Man, when you start to embrace these principles, when you start to apply them in your approach to God's Word, it's amazing how alive it becomes, how real it becomes. That said, uh, rightly dividing is key and and in every one of our Bible studies, we uh, want to make sure that um, we are doing that so that we don't um, cause any confusion. Uh, or in some cases, as I was talking to this young man today that I was discipling, um, this is where cults begin. And false teachings and religions is where they take something out of context, fail to rightly divide the word of truth. So these principles hold me accountable when I'm teaching, when I'm sharing God's word with you and to you. So uh, I want you guys to um, master them, to make them second nature and a part of how you approach God's word. Because what's really awesome when I'm sitting with some of you discipling and, and you've been applying these and you're learning these, it's awesome to hear um, a lot of your feedback. And oftentimes I learn a lot of stuff from you guys. It was really cool. Michelle texted me a message, Michelle Marmon, the other day about, about a, a, a Bible doctrine, about sacrifices in the Old Testament and when I replied and she replied back she already knew the answer she had the answer so that to me is really encouraging it's really reaffirming knowing and realizing that when we just simply apply these rules these principles the Bible comes together just in an incredible way so that's what we're about this is how we approach our Bible studies um, even Sunday morning when we're teaching God's Word more from a preaching perspective or approach um, those principles are always second nature. Again, they're on page three in your booklet. Know them, embrace them, uh, because we'll be looking at a few of them tonight. Well, these are the, the three that we'll be looking at tonight specifically as it relates to tonight's question. Again, speaking of questions, if you have a question, because we're going to do Q&A for the next, what did I say last Sunday, for the next couple months? 
Did I say two weeks? <laughs> Somebody's ready for the minor profits, I think, right? So uh, we're going to continue doing the Q&A stuff at least through July, maybe early August. Um, just depends on how crazy um, my weeks get. We just went through a lot of stuff here the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and, and I don't want to seem lazy or lackadaisical, but the Q&A stuff is, um, simplifies my life a little bit when I'm having to teach through the, a specific book or like the Minor Prophets or like we finished the book of Hosea before all this COVID stuff hit. Um, you know, I have to do a heck of a lot more preparing and, and, and laying out and coming up with maps and diagrams to facilitate or to provide a better perspective. So um, I kind of like Q&A because um, I could slack a little bit and, uh, and uh, some of the questions are, um, are uh, I'm not going to say simple, but there's, they, you know, I've, I've had to answer them before in the past, so it kind of, uh, kind of helps a little bit in that sense. So now, now you guys know my real heart, that I'm a lazy slacker. So I apologize up front. So um, that said, uh, <laughs> that said, we are going to look at the question tonight. Speaking of questions, again, if you have a question over the next two or three weeks, I actually have another one for next week. Here's an interesting question that was posed to me today by none other than my beautiful mother-in-law, Rosalie. Uh, she wants to know what the Bible says about cremation, right? It's extremely uh, prevalent today and, and a very practical kind of question. Um, is it wrong? Is it whatever? So uh, those are real things that people deal with, especially when you've got relatives coming from a, a, a certain kind of worldview or, or perspective. So I think we're going to take some time, probably not the whole two hours talking about creation. I mean creation, about cremation. But I do want to, uh, cremation, creation, um, but I do want to address it because it's something that um, um, that we all know a lot of us are having to deal with as we have loved ones. Um, we In our church, we provide for folks this little booklet. Uh, George Martin introduced it to us several years ago called The Five Wishes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were preparing mm -hmm. another session that he was going to teach. Uh, but it's a Wednesday night thing that we do, very practical. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Sylvia could teach it someday. <laughs> But the five wishes are really cool because it's a document, and it could be—it's a legal document. But once it gets notarized, that we use to give to the hospital if somebody ends up, um, if somebody ends up um, uh, incapacitated or whatever. You guys like that word, <laughs> incapacitated, um, or can't function. So your wishes are documented, and if you're okay with it, we could keep a, a file here so that we are following through. I know when our 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 brother Nick Cloakey got really sick. Um, his was complete. So when we went there to 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 be with him at the hospital when he was in in um, ICU and all and literally unconscious, um, it was really cool because the the medical staff at, at uh, Christus were able to just follow through and we sat with them, we met with them. So it's a really cool tool. We definitely need to share it with everybody again at some point. And the reason why I'm saying all this is because. Um, we're going to be sitting with my mother. This is coming. This is this is personal for me now. So my mom's really thinking about her her estate, her will, and and I mentioned my sister Anna, uh, the five wishes, and one of the things we were talking. My my wife and I were there today. I said, Mom, this is why it's important because you have to tell us up front, like right now, in this document, whether or not you want to be cremated. And right away her response was, I don't want to do that. So uh, I don't want to burn here. Yeah. So, hey, I get it. I understand. So we're going to honor that, right? So this is what I'm getting at. So a lot of different perspectives, and that's okay. We live in what? The age of grace. The age of grace. And um, that doesn't mean that you have the freedom to do whatever you want as it relates to sin. But it's God liberates us and allows us a lot of liberty when it comes to very practical things, knowing and understanding and the cultures in which we live in, a lot of the things that we're dealing with. So I, I say all that to say this. Great question, Rosalie Ashbaugh. And we will definitely address that next week. So any other questions that you might have, you can email them. I prefer an email, biblestudy at ascentbible.church or text me. Um, most of the questions I get are via text. And that's okay. What's nice about email... I could uh, 
capture them, save them, whatever, versus a text. I just have to do a little bit more work, and I already admitted for be, uh, being lazy, so that's why. All right, happy July 1st. Um, already our summer's moving pretty quick. And, uh, oh, having said that, next week, no Bible study, okay? So we're, gonna, we're just gonna cancel Bible study next week because our sharing letter, we need to take a little tiny break. We haven't had a chance to have any kind of a break this summer. Um, I'm gonna go and camp out at uh, Clyde and Lorraine's property. So I got a cool view of, of Baldy right there. Uh, man, you guys have great views of the mountains. But anyway, just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna go somewhere, I don't know where. Um, camping, she hates to camp. Right, Larry, we're going to count, right? <laughs> whatever one. <laughs> yeah, right. Now she says whatever you want because you have all these witnesses. All right. So here's tonight's question. This question comes to us by from my brother Steve Romero. Um, and his question is this. What does God mean by these verses? And the two verses that I'm referring to uh, are Genesis 131. I don't know if you can see them or read them where you're at. I hope you can. Um, and Proverbs 16, 4. And then he goes on, and I'll read the, let me read the verses to you just to kind of give you some context or some, some context to the question. But it says in Genesis 1, chapter 31, I think you're all familiar with this verse. This is the very last verse that God lays out in Genesis chapter number one after the creation or the restructuring of his creation to bring about his plan, right? Remember, you've heard me mention it a number of times that the Bible is a very profound theme. It's a battle for a kingdom and a throne. I, I want you to not lose sight of that as we start talking and having some discussion tonight about this whole notion of evil or the day of evil, right? Which is in the second verse that we're gonna look at. So the God has three plans. He's got a plan for the universe. Whether you realize it or know it or not, when you drive home tonight, and you're looking up at that night sky, all those constellations and the, the North Star and Arturus and all the stuff that we're able to see in that night sky, it's there for a purpose. It's there for a reason. And the, God's word reveals to us its purpose. Anything and everything that God does in his word is with a purpose. He also has a plan for this planet, for planet Earth. It's very significant in his plan, right? Again, not one verse in the Bible very first verse in all of the Bible, this entire book, this place shows up, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, very significant. And we live on planet earth. Uh, whether you're mindful of that or whether you're aware of that, you live on a place called earth. Very special, very unique place. I don't even know if you know this about the Bible, but there's several constellations that are mentioned in the Bible, like the Pleiades, Orion, Arcturus, some of these other places out in the cosmos, but there's only one other planet mentioned in the Bible besides Earth, and it's found in the book of Acts. And it's a significant planet, it's an important planet, it's an interesting planet as it relates to the Babylonian mysteries and, and, and Satan and some of his domain stuff. But Earth has a very significant role. Earth is mentioned some 180 times in scripture. Uh, so God has a very unique purpose and plan for it. It's been here since the, listen to this, since the beginning. When's the beginning? You guys know from your timeline, look at your timeline on page, is it 12, 11, or 12, whatever it is. Your dispensational timeline. Uh, what's that, what's, what page is that on, Lorraine, are you there? 12, right? The dispensational chart? 12? 12? You know when the beginning was? Look way to the far left where it says eternity past. That's the beginning. It's before time. It's before time as we know it. If you look at and study Genesis chapter 1, time as we know it doesn't happen till verse number 14 of Genesis 1. But in Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There were some interesting things going on on planet earth. In eternity past I don't know if you know that or realize it or not and if you want to get some of the depth behind that with me going off on some tangent go look at Ezekiel chapter number 28 sometime and it'll 
reveal to, uh, to you exactly what was going on, what was playing out, where God's throne was. Now, God's throne physically isn't where it was because of where planet Earth, planet Earth is where it's at today because of the fall. And when I'm talking about the fall, there's actually two falls in the Bible. There's the fall of Adam and Eve, and then there's the fall of Lucifer. That's the whole reason why Adam and Eve showed up. This is the whole reason why Genesis 1 exists. Here's Genesis 1. The whole purpose for Genesis 1 is God restructuring, recreating, for lack of a better term, his creation so that he could bring about his plan because of what happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. A perfect, idealistic, perfect creation, Genesis 1-1 where the throne was in this place called Eden. Never called it the Garden of Eden in Ezekiel 20. He called it Eden, the Garden of God. And that's where his throne was. And it was in that place in Genesis 1-1 where this angelic being one day said, all right, I'm done doing this. No more worshiping God. And this is why we're where we're at today and why Genesis chapter 1 as a whole exists. So that God could deal with the fall of Lucifer and one third of the angels that left with him that fell. And you know what God does? He restructures he, his creation. Look at Genesis 1 1 in your Bible. Are you there? Yes. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the what? Earth. Earth have been singular, but if you get to chapter number two, after he's done restructuring everything, including everything that he said he was doing here in Genesis 131 and at 1, 131 a minute, look at how chapter two begins. Thus the what? Heavens. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and the host of them. Now you're dealing with some plurality here. Now there's multiple heavens. And if you know your Bible, there are three of them. You see them laid out in Psalms chapter 148. You see again God going back in Revelation chapter 21 to one heaven. When, when, when the whole new heaven and a new earth, remember, it doesn't say new heavens. It says a new heaven and a new earth. You know what God's done? He's going back to how things were in Genesis 1-1. So this timeline that you're looking at every Wednesday night is nothing more than really God going full circle. Beginning with Genesis 1-1 and, and ending up with Revelation chapter 21, verse number 2 or 3. He's just gone full circle. But you know what you find in that circle? Those seven dispensations where man showed up. Where Adam and Eve show up. Where Noah shows up. Where the Tower of Babel shows up. Let then Abraham... Isaac and Jacob and the 12 sons and Moses and all the Old Testament stuff. And then you get to the cross and you see the cross on your chart, right? I'm looking at this chart right here. You guys are familiar with this chart? Then you get to the cross. Jesus shows up and somewhere along this little arch here that we know as the church age, the age of grace, some of you were born. You're still in the church age. You're still in this age of grace. But all this, imagine if we took this timeline and we just bent it into a circle. That's God going full circle. Here's eternity past. Now look at what you see on the far right. Eternity what? Future. Eternity future. All God is doing with this timeline is restoring what fell in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. When Lucifer said, I will, I will be worshipped on the mount. I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will. You know, what it, you know what life is now? When we talk about when we talk about God's will versus Lucifer's will or even our will, it's a battle of wills, isn't it? Will we align our will to His? Because all you have to know and understand, and we talk about this all the time, is that history, look at principle number four of your Bibles, of your principles, right? The Bible is a history book. You know what history is? Nothing more. God moves, Satan counters. God moves, Satan counters. 
God moves, Satan counters. That's the plan of redemption. God's in all these dispensations, these little blue humps, God is trying, <laughs> not that he can't and not that he won't. He's putting and he's desiring to bring about redemption to a fallen creation. So what's the issue? What's the challenge? Why is it that it doesn't happen in all these periods? Anybody know? One one thought. Sin. Sin is a, definitely a factor. I'm glad you bring that up because we're going to talk about it tonight, right? But what is the one thing, and we uh, often reference it, but what is the one thing that God cannot control? Your will. Your will and my, your, my, your will and my will. So what you see on that chart is nothing more than man's will usurping God's will. So you know what God does? All right, I'll just, I'll just start anew. I mean, there's a plan and a purpose. Keep in mind, he could, he could, he could have created everything in a split second. But he did what he did because he has purpose behind it. Because not only is he providing us this dispensational timeline, but he's also providing us a chronological timeline in terms of why he's doing it or how long he wants to, re or what it is that he wants to reveal to us. So he's providing us in these timelines. Look at your principle number two. What's, I mean, principle number three. What's that principle about? Principle of what? Time. Time, man. It's important. It's imperative. Not only do you live on earth, but you're bound to God's timeline. You're bound to his clock, his watch. Every one of us in here are promised, for the most part, right? S average American lifespan, 70 a year in the medical field, right? Donna Martin, 78.3 years, I think, is the average lifespan of an American, right? That's the issue. What's the, what are we doing with the one life that we're given? Is it glorifying to him or not? Is the issue. Because Steve's question, what does God mean by these verses and the two verses that are displayed or that we're referring to, these are part of his question. It says in John, I'm sorry, in Genesis 131, after God restructured everything before he talks about the seventh day, or that now that there's multiple heavens again, he says, and God saw that everything that he had made and behold, it was, listen to this, this phrase, it was what? It was very good. If you go back and read the other days of creation, whenever Jesus made, or whenever Jesus created that stuff and, and, and restructured stuff, the Bible says, and on the sixth day he did this or he did that, and he says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. But when he saw this entire creation Everything that he had redone in Genesis chapter 1, the very last verse says, he saw what he had just done and it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This is right after he creates Adam and Eve. Go back and if you look at verses 26, 27, and 28 is where you actually see the creation of man in that verse. And then Steve also wanted to compare this verse with Genesis 139 because he's asking about how does the very good thing apply to this verse, Proverbs 64? And this is, these are the words of Solomon. Look at principle number 12 of Bible study. I mean, of the, of the principles. What does principle 12 say? Types. Look at page number 19 on your in your book. Who wrote, who wrote Proverbs? Solomon, didn't he? Wisest man that ever lived. As a matter of fact, in Second Kings, I'm, I'm sorry, in First Kings chapter four, the Bible says or reveals to us that Solomon Solomon wrote three thousand proverbs. This is one of those proverbs, one of those three thousand proverbs. Three thousand of those proverbs, and he says this: "The Lord hath made all things what for Himself." That's creation, the Genesis one thirty one story. But then he says this. Yea, even the wicked for the for the day of evil. What is that about? And his question is really the 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 the, the main part of his question. Or he drills down. He's, he's asking when people often question why God lets bad things happen. 
are these the verses that answer that question? And then really the follow-up was, how can wickedness be very good? That's his question. Because there it is. Yeah, even the wicked for the day of evil. Principle number seven. The words and phrases of the Bible matter, right? You know how you... Get a, get a simple answer, or probably not even a simple answer, but a quick answer to this question? Just do a phrase study on the day of evil. It's really interesting. You'll get a profound revelation of what that is. See how the words and phrases matter, Scripture? See why you need to not just read a verse or just a context, but, but I was referring to also principle number 12, Solomon, right? That's the types, right? Speech of types. Look at your little table on page 19, I think it is. And, and what's that table consist of? The types of what? <clears throat> the types of Christ and the types of Antichrist in the Bible or in the Old Testament. Did you know that there's 18 types of Antichrist in the Old Testament? And 21 types of Christ? What's a type? A type is not, uh, is not a model. It's like we've been talking in the book of Joshua, right? We've been, we've been spending the last three weeks on Sunday mornings in the book of Joshua. Joshua is a great type of who? Look at your list. Is Joshua part, part of that list? Yes. He's there, isn't he, on the type of Christ? Yes. If you keep going down after Joshua, who else shows up? Is Solomon on that list? Yes. Interesting, huh? Jump over to the Antichrist list. He's on there, He's on there too, isn't he? Oh. Isn't that fascinating? You know what? Of all the types of Christ and Antichrist in the Bible speaking of biblical typology he's the only guy that shows up on both lists this guy got to experience incredible amazing mm -hmm. profound things this is when he wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon but man when he went to the dark side he went to the dark side things got really ugly in his life Israel went into captivity for 2,700 years because of Solomon. All because of this one guy. Talk about generational sin. Sin, right? Mm -hmm. And the impacts and the effects. So it's no coincidence that God would choose this guy to write and reveal this thought to us. The Lord hath made all things for himself creation, which is consistent with Genesis 131, but what's this whole evil thing about? <clears throat> or what is he saying when he says, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil? This is why you have to understand principle number three, which is the timeline. You have to know and realize what transpired for him to be able to connect these dots between what went on in Genesis 131 to which was different than what Solomon actually witnessed when he came around in history, which is about 1,000 B.C., some 1,200 years after, some 2,000 years after Genesis, no, 4,000 years after, 3,000 years after Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. That's where this kind of whole story plays out. So let's just again look at principle number one, which is what? The principle of context. So let's look at some of the context, some of the things. Where does Genesis 131 show up? On your timeline. And then what dispensation is that? Innocence. Say it, Lorraine, I heard you say it. Innocence. Innocence. Isn't that cool? Are you getting the picture? <clears throat> you know what? You know when when Genesis 131, because if, again, if you go back to verses 26, 27, and 28, 3, 4, 5 verses before 31, guess what God's doing? He's creating who? Look at the text. He's creating who? Adam and Eve. He, not only does he create them on the sixth day, but he also gives them a commission, and he says to them, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and what? Replenish. And replenish. And what is so cool about chapter 2 is God now details what he did in the life of Adam in that chapter. And you know what was, so chapters 1 and chapter 2 especially, all that is happening 
in the dispensation, look at your timeline, in the dispensation of innocence. Innocent. You know where he's living? In a place called the Garden of Eden. The boundaries are laid out for you there in verse number 7. In verse number 7, the Bible says that he took dust from the ground, he formed Adam, and then he says that he breathed, the Spirit of God breathed into him, and he became what? He became a living soul. Now you're seeing God laying out his plan and his purpose for this dude, for human, for the human part of his creation. Frankly, the most important part. If you look at the first five days, God did some really cool stuff with the animals, with, with nature, with the stars, with the cosmos. But nothing was as unique and as special as when he created man. Because he had a plan for man. And in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2, listen to what God says to him in verse number 15. This is really key. We read these verses, but we also lose sight of the fact that God is trying to reveal to us some profound things that are playing out in the story. In verse 14 is where you find the boundaries of the Garden of Eden. Remember we were looking at that, I think, on, on Sunday briefly when he told Joshua, wherever, you're, wherever you step, and these are the boundaries I want you to lay out. The boundaries of the Garden of the original Garden of Eden, the, the boundaries of the, the land of promise are huge. All the way from northern Egypt to southern Iraq. All the way to South Central Turkey. It's a huge triangle are the boundaries of the biblical Garden of Eden, which is what you find here in these verses from verse number nine all or verse number number ten all the way down to verse number fourteen. And then look what he says in fifteen. Look what God says to Moses. I'm sorry, look at what God says about Adam in verse number fifteen. And the Lord God took the man and he put him where? Into the Garden of Eden. And then he says something really profound. To do what? Dress. To dress it and to keep it. In other words, he says to this guy, I'm putting you in this very unique, very special place known as the Garden of Eden. And Adam, I only have two purposes for you. I need you to take care of it. That's what it means to dress it. To be a good steward of it, right? The principle of stewardship in our lives. It's amazing what God will do with us and through us when we're good stewards. And then he says something really profound to him. Now I also need you to keep it. What does that mean, keep? To own it? No. That's an American mentality about everything. Keep it, keep it. We want to keep everything. No. He's telling him, I need you to protect it. You need to be a protector, Adam. Look at the context. Protect from what? Look at your timeline. Principle number two. You know what happened out here? The fall of Lucifer. God knew in Genesis chapter two that Lucifer, the fallen angel, the serpent, would be showing up. And sure enough, he does, huh? Where does he show up? Chapter three. Are you with me? Now, who does he show up to? Does he show up to Adam? Eve. Shows up to Eve. Now begs the question, where was Adam? Right? Doesn't say that Adam was there. There's a belief that he was there. Actually, she gives him some of the fruit after she took of it. But the very first words out of the devil's mouth in Genesis chapter 3, in verse number 1, are these words. Mark it down. Yea, hath God said. <coughs> Question mark. In other words, this is how she, this is how the serpent couched his question to Eve. Well, actually, let's read the whole verse. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? that ye shall not eat of every tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And again, I didn't really expound on the thought, but if you go back and, and read and finish the rest of chapter number two, when God put Adam in the garden, he says, all right, dude, I'm going to put two trees in the midst of the garden. In the heart of this garden, I'm going to put up two trees. One tree is called the tree of life, and the other tree is called the tree of the what? The knowledge of good and, catch this, evil. 
And he says, eat all you want from this tree, this tree of life. See, when he created Adam and Eve, God's plan from the very beginning was that they live forever, just like you and I. And you know what was going to be the source of eternal life for them? Them partaking of the tree of life. And then this guy shows up. And the very thing he, the very first thing he does is he gets her to doubt. To plant, he, we know what he does, he plants seeds of doubt in her life. Mm -hmm. Did you ever study and did you ever stop and consider the question mark? And the shape of the question mark? Serpent. You know what it is? In the shape of a serpent, and that little dot at the bottom is the seed. Very first time, that is a symbol that showed up in antiquity before it became part of the English grammar structure. And this is the first time the question mark shows up in the Bible and it's coming from none other than the serpent himself. And you know what he does? He gets her to doubt the woman. He gets the woman to doubt what God said. Because if you go back and read the two chapters together, the three chapters together, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, they're really profound. They're really key in really understanding and embracing what really happened. God never revealed this stuff to the woman. He revealed it to Adam. You don't see her showing up till the end of chapter 2 when he puts the dude to sleep and takes a rib and creates this incredible partner for him to minister with, to him to come through on the Great Commission, which is to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. It was Adam that he says, here are the two trees. You know what bugs me about that dude? Just like most of us husbands and fathers, we failed in our responsibility in dis discipling, our, uh, his, he can discipling his wife. So when he shows up in chapter 3, she has no real idea, no real clue about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil versus the... I'm sure she did, right? But at the end of the day, it was to Adam who God revealed it to. But look who he shows up to. He shows up to her. He shows up to Eve. And he gets her to question and he gets her to doubt, which ultimately that doubt leads to what? to deception and he deceives her and what does she do she partakes of the what the of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil she made her choice there's the free will thing again and then what does she do her husband comes back from his hearty ride or hanging out with his lab hiking up to Nambel Lake I don't know where the heck the dude was but he shows back home and she says, man, this fruit is awesome. It's opened my eyes to the knowledge. To the knowledge of good and evil. Wow. And you know what the, ultimately that led to? The three D's, I call them, of Genesis chapters 2 and 3. Or 3. Doubt led to deception, and deception led to death. Death. You know what? Now he's telling her, take of it, you won't die. You surely won't die. That deception, that lie, causes, you know what? We'll take of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it's going to make you like God. It's going to make you wise like God. And she's tempted in the same exact three areas that Jesus was tempted by the, by the devil in Luke chapter Four and in Matthew chapter 4 and the very sins that John speaks about in 1 John chapter number 2 verse 16 when he says and he talks about the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the what? The and the pride of life those are the three basic areas that we all fail in and this guy is still there spiritually trying to get us to fall getting us to doubt deceiving us and ultimately destroying us, separating us from God. That's all death means. Death means separation. In Adam's case, it happened physically and spiritually, right? How do we know that? 
they went and they hid from God. That's kind of what we do whenever we're not where we need to be in our relationship with God. The only thing he wants from us is intimacy. And then when we're doing our own little thing, we got our own little agenda going, our will is driving our lives, and all of a sudden he's convicting us and he's coming and looking for us. What is it that we do? We hide. Why do we hide? You know what it's called? It's called shame. That's when I see people stop coming to church. And all of a sudden, they're not now shame will ultimately lead to guilt. And now they're saying, man, I can't go to church because I'm not worthy. It's exactly why you need to come back. Because there isn't a person in this room that's worthy of anything. God's all about restoring. He's all about reconciling. He's all about forgiving. And the one thing that we need to always do in our journey, whenever we tend to wander, whenever we are doubting and deceived and ultimately separated from God, death, is come back to him, man. Because he waits and he waits and he waits for you to come back. And we know the rest of the story. They hid from God, number one, and the first thing. And then once God calls them out, he finds them. He knew where they were. But just like with us, his words are found in Genesis chapter 3. Adam, what does he ask? He doesn't ask, he doesn't ask about Eve. He says, Adam what? Adam, where art thou? Where are you, dude? God's God. He knew exactly where he was, but he always puts the onus on us to respond. And he says, we heard your voice in the garden, and we found and we realized that we were naked. Shame. And we did what? We hid. And then he goes, what do you mean you hid? And he goes, this woman that you gave me, it's all her fault. She's the one that gave me of the fruit. And then what does the woman do? She blames the serpent. You know what we start to do in this life? You know what begins to happen in us whenever we wander, whenever we begin to hide because of our shame and our guilt? You know what begins to happen? We start to blame everybody but ourselves. We start to fail our responsibility. Am I doing something wrong, Marvin? No, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I never. I came over here, and whenever you raise your hand, you're telling me I'm off the screen. That's why I came back right away. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Marvin. That's a question. Right hand question. Left hand, I'm out of bounds. He's a referee back there for me. So you asked this last week. I asked this last week. I'm, I'm going to repeat so they could hear. You talked about uh, to uh, research um, okay, or, word, um, do a word study. Nakedness. Huh? Nakedness. Nakedness. Now, is that the shame that we're talking about? That's part of the shame, exactly. In did you Did you do a phrase study on it? Word study? Exodus chapter 28. Okay. Or no, 32, 25. Actually, the verse that I wanted you to go to um, so a little bit of a rabbit trail, which is good because he's asking about the whole nakedness because it, it kind of falls in line with the whole shame thing. But what I, I think what Marvin is asking about when we looked at the whole ham story, right? When the Bible says that, that the boys saw the nakedness of their father, I, I challenge you to go into the scriptures and find out exactly what that means. So the key is to apply principle number 12, words and phrases, so if you do a phrase study on nakedness of that father, the Bible will tell you exactly what happened with Ham and Noah. You don't need me to tell you. You don't need me to interpret for you. The Bible interprets itself. And that's what Marvin is asking. Did anybody find the, that truth? Well, I was, I was asking because we were talking about shame. Yeah. Like, uh, here in the garden. Yeah. And that's what I came across. So okay. So no, he didn't find the answer. <laughs> So I would encourage each and every one who you know what whoever finds the answer I'll give you um, I'll give you something I don't know what oh you get a free mask you get a mask you can take one you 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 uh, you unsubordinate mules that refuse to wear masks no so uh, no but that's a really cool phrase there's a profound truth. If you want to understand, we were talking, I'm glad you brought that up, Marvin, because I totally spaced it out. But if you want to know what happened between Noah and his son Ham, 
Do a phrase study on the nakedness of thy father. I'll give you another hint. It's found, your answer will be found in the book of Leviticus. Do you want me to give you another hint? Yes. It'll be found in chapter number 18. <laughs> It'll be found in chapter number 18 of Leviticus. So somebody come back and tell me next week what that is. Marvin's going there right now. Yeah. I know he is. So, but, so check this out. Getting back to Genesis chapter 3. They hide because of their shame. They cover themselves with fig leaves. Now what are they doing? Just exactly what the human condition does. They start to blame, right? He blames the woman. The woman blames the serpent. And the next thing that you see happening or the part of that whole storyline, now they're fearful. The Bible says we heard you and we were fearful. So fear enters into the heart of man for the first time in history. For the very first time. Yes, Marvin. Nancy Metcalf says that she has the answer. Okay, cool. Tell her to type it in for Larry and we'll do it at the end of Bible study. Okay. Tell her. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> tell her to type it in at the end of tell her to type it in at the very end of Bible study. Go ahead. And then we'll uh, we'll 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 reveal it to that at the end. And Nancy, you get you get something from She wants a hug. She wants a oh very cool. That's it, that's easy. <laughs> So, uh, where was I? Okay, so let's go back to this chart, page 12. This is really key. I'm going to let Lorraine answer this. So where were we in Genesis chapter 2? And where are we now? Conscience. Are you there? Are you with me? Why? One reason why. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now they knew about evil. That word conscience, Marvin just mentioned, I love what he just said. Two syllables, con, science. You know what con means in Latin or Spanish? With. Science means what? Knowledge. knowledge. Now they're all about knowledge. You, you can literally say or claim that Adam and Eve are the first Gnostics that you find in the Bible. Where for them it's all about knowledge now and not about a relationship with God. Not about the eternal life that He promised them if they would have just partake, or if they would have just taken from the tree, from the tree of life. You know what's so sad about the whole tree of life thing? It doesn't show up in the Bible till when? Till the book of Revelation chapter 21. You know what shows up again? The tree of life. Because God's gonna springboard into the cosmos a, new, a whole new creation through that tree exactly what he designed and intended to do in Genesis chapter number 2. And you see in chapter 3, literally, the garden is blocked off, man, spiritually and literally and physically. And now they're in this new era called conscience. So that whole conscience thing begins to be a part of... Here's a, here's a key phrase. This is a, this is a phrase that I that I stole from Ravi Zacharias years ago because I love the phrase or the term that he used to define conscience. The human condition. Are you with me? The human condition. It's that part of us that experiences shame, blame, and fear. That is the human condition. Anybody familiar with that human condition? Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever done that? You know why you do that? Conscience. You're a whole different creature, man. Get to go over to Genesis chapter 5. I want you to see something. I'll tell you what, as you go to chapter 5, hold your finger there, but also look at verse 26 in chapter number 1. When God is, this is the sixth day of creation. This, Steve was asking about the sixth day, right? And God saw that everything that he made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and morning with the sixth day. I'm going to tell you why he says that it was very good. This is why God perceived that it was very good, especially that sixth day. Watch this. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. There's the word dominion. In other words, God's plan has always been a kingdom. A kingdom on this earth. And let them have dominion. Do you notice what he said there? He said them. 
Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Dominion over even the creeps in the world. Can you imagine, you ladies, you would have had dominion over the creeps in your life. <laughs> Look at verse, for some of you, that's a lot of dudes, huh? Verse 27, and God created man in what? In his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. You know, this is a key thought. Take that word again, the words of Bible study. The words of the Bible are what matter. Verse uh, Principle number 12, image and likeness. He draws a distinction between the two. You know what the image is always revealing to? God's image is who you who they were like spiritually. The likeness is who they were physically. So when he creates Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 1, Genesis 2, they were perfect images spiritually and physically of the Lord Jesus Christ. They looked just like them. They had glorified bodies. Now look what happens in Genesis chapter 5. Look at verse 1. And this is the book of the generations of Adam. All right, catch this. Chapter 5, right? Look at verse number uh, 1. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. What did he, did he just refer to? How he created him physically like the Lord. Verse 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and he called their name Adam in the day that they were created. Verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and he begat in his what? In his own likeness and in his image and called his name Seth. Did you catch that? So now we know from chapter 4, which we didn't even cover, is the story of, the, of Cain and Abel. Because of conscience, because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now you see the first murder play out in the Bible in the very next chapter, right? Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. That's how the world became that quick. How the human condition began to kick in. And became a, be a part of who they were. So now, God's done with Cain. Abel has been... He's been isolated from, God, from, the, from God's plan. And you get to chapter 5, and now God's creating again. But now when he creates, and Adam is having offspring, whose image are they in? They're an image of Adam. Not just in his image, but also in his likeness. And you know what's so sad and so pathetic? That image and that likeness exist to this day. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is New Testament now, right? Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says in verse 12, wherefore? Listen closely, right? If you go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says... That, that there is none righteous, no, not one, that all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says something really cool that I forgot. Thank you. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, right? So there's the whole grace story. And you know what's in between those two verses? Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. Romans 5.12. Yes. You know what Romans 5.12 reveals to us? Look at this. Wherefore is by one man sin. Who's that one man? Adam. 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 Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Separation from God because of his sin. Watch this. And so death passed upon all men for that what? For that all have sinned. This is what they used to teach us in catechism back in the day. I don't know if they still do that. But it was called original sin. You know what I refer to it now? As the human condition. This is the human condition. We inherited a fallen nature. 
So in Jeremiah chapter number 17, no, verse, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 9, I think it is. Jeremiah chapter 9. I don't know. Hold on. This is going to be important. Larry, do me a, do me a favor. Do a quick search on Day of Evil. I had it earlier in my head, but I forgot it. So now you have this fallen human condition. And on that timeline, from Genesis chapter 5 all the way till the day that Jesus comes back at the second coming of Christ, men are dealing with this thing called original sin, the fallen nature, the human condition. What does that consist of or how does it manifest? Shame, blame, and fear. So now Solomon shows up, right? In 1 Kings chapter 4, writes the Proverbs, and he writes this verse in Proverbs 64, a guy that was both a type and an anti-type, or a type of Christ and a type of antichrist. Why? Because of how and where he ended up because of one thing. What? The human condition. What happens when we get our eyes off God? You know what, you know what Solomon quit doing in his life? He quit reaching out to the Lord. He quit asking and praying for wisdom. And you know what he began to do? He began to focus on the things of this world. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. And he began to count his wealth and to focus on his stuff. Before you know it, man, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. You get to chapter 12, and he's bringing all these, these women of these Idonians and all these Gentile kingdoms and all these and their whoredoms and everything else into into the God's people. And then in chapter 13, two chapters later, you know what's happening? A civil war. You want to know what's going on in our country today? What's going on in America today? The human condition. We're seeing Adam's image, Adam, Adam's likeness, original sin manifest itself like never before. The Lord has made all things for himself. What we can't lose sight of that this verse is written after the fall, after the fall of Adam. So now man has this free will to either choose good or choose evil. But at the end of the day, he chooses. Where's the Jeremiah verse? 17. Jeremiah 17, thank 17 you. 17 and 18. Yeah, exactly. That's where I thought it was. I think I had said 17 earlier, I thought, right? But maybe not. Jeremiah, go ahead and turn there if you'd like, because now, as we look at these, these questions, and Steve's asking a question, how can wickedness be very good? It's not very good. It's not very good, because when he writes these words in Genesis chapter 131, it was before the fall. It was when Adam and Eve were in their innocent stage, where God was just prepared and ready to to use them and to glorify them. And he's and the, what I love about God, what I so appreciate about him is he puts those trees in the garden so that I could choose. The power of free will. I am so grateful for that. But you know what? If you choose blessing or cursing, life or death, you're going to be given account or you'll be responsible for that choice. I appreciate the fact that he gives us free will. But here's what I want you to be mindful of. Here's what we need to consider. What we've been given in the New Testament is the resource, if you will, or the resources that we need in order to make the right choices. So that our will isn't driven by us because you know what we're doing? You're going to either follow God's will, right? Remember we talked about that on Sunday? What's God's will? Somebody say it. To be Christ-like, to be conformed into his image. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. 27, 28, and 29. God's will is the same for everybody in this room, and that is to become like Jesus. Could you imagine if every one of us became more like Christ? We would be more loving, we would be more caring, we would experience more peace, more joy, more long-suffering towards others, more gentleness, more goodness. How about faith? We've been talking about faith, meekness, and you know what temperance is? You're level, man. You're not letting your emotions drive you. 
That's what we would manifest if we were genuinely becoming Christ-like. And I don't know where I was going with this thought. But man, you see, the, you see a world today that is so unlike Christ and you wonder why people are angry and, and destructive and, and lawless. You know what you're seeing? The human condition. You know what you're seeing? Evil. You're evil. You're seeing evil manifest itself. Not and again, this has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the politics or anything else that's going on. We're talking about men's hearts. Because I'm gonna have you everybody turn now to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 17. And I want you to read a verse before we look at verses 17 and 18. There's a verse that shows here in Jeremiah that we're all familiar with. And again, what's the context of Jeremiah? God's people are in captivity. God's people find themselves captive to this, this oppressive Gentile kingdom, the Babylonians. And Jeremiah is one of those prophets that is out there warning God's people. And this is one of the things that he's, that he's imparting to them, that he's, that he's driving home, that he's saying, man, we can't allow ourselves to go there. And he says this in Jeremiah chapter 17. Look with, look with me verse, in verse number 9. Look what he says. Anybody familiar with this verse? The heart is what? Is deceitful, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Did you catch that? Another word for wicked is evil. Who can know it? That's the verse that is found in, of all places, Jeremiah chapter 17. You know what he's referring to? The human condition. I read this verse and I preached this at one time at, at some church I remember and this lady came up to me. How dare you teach that our hearts are wicked? I didn't say that. God's word does. The issue is it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to live there. That is the beauty of redemption. This is what is so cool about what God has done. Look at your chart again. In the church age. Right? Because you know what he did in the church age? After he saved you, what did he do? He gave you the Holy Spirit of God. To transform you, to change you. This is why in Romans chapter number 8, the Bible says that the believer is now redeemed and now in the what? In the image of God. So the fallen image that Seth lost that we read about in Genesis chapter 5 and all the people that, that have gone through history until, until Jesus shows up and, and the Holy Spirit is in, or in, in, in... What's the word I'm looking for? Um... Indwelling the believer? He's driving home the issue, man. The heart is desperately wicked. Man, who can know it? Michelle? And, um, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Genesis 1.26 and Job 26.2. So God is a triune God. So in eternity past, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit were, were with God. And Revelation... Let's put it this way instead of we're with God. Our God. Because now you can call that, there's a theology or a doctrine out there called modalism, if you're not careful. When you say Jesus and the Holy Spirit were with God, here's, that I would, here's how I would couch it if you want to be biblical. Um, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are God. Are God. Yes, that's what you can't lose sight of. So you just said in Acts, as we receive the Holy Spirit, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. But in rap, during the rapture, the Holy Spirit is no longer here because we're in heaven. The church is in heaven. I know I, I, I don't want to go into rabbit hole, but when the millennium, the Holy Spirit yeah. is back. Yes. So just for, for everybody benefiting out there that may not have heard the question because it's a Holy Spirit question and she's wanting to, Michelle is asking, how does the Holy Spirit play out in some of the, in, in your timeline if you guys are on page, I always forget the page numbers, the 12? If you're, if you're on page number 12, what's the Holy Spirit doing here? Because he's indwelling the believer here, 
And at the rapture, he leaves here with the Holy Spirit. Here's what you have to understand, just like he was. The Holy Spirit has never really left. What is unique about the church, what is unique about you and me, is God in this dispensation, in this period, which is so mind-blowing, has chosen to indwell the believer. In the tribulation period, and even in the millennium, he's going to manifest himself differently through his spirit. And you're going to see that in Isaiah chapter number 11, and in Revelation chapter number somewhere, when he talks about the seven spirits of God, now he's dealing with people externally again, not in dwelling, but outwardly. God never leaves. Even during the tribulation period, God's still present. You know how we know that? Because he's protecting the nation of Israel, right? When they're fleeing into the wilderness, when he's hiding them in, 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 in Bophra. Remember we were talking about um, uh, that place in Jordan. Uh, Petra and all these places in the, when he says flee into the mountains. You know who God, you know who's doing that? The Holy Spirit. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Where it's, when in, the, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, right? And the earth was a form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And in the ver next verse, verse 3, the Bible says what? And then the Spirit of God moved. The Spirit of God has always been present. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. Jesus is God. God is Jesus. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. This is the circular reasoning thing, but at the end of the day... That's biblical theology. That's the issue, is who is Jesus? If we would never forget who he really is and what he means in our lives, we would be different people as we leave this place, as we venture on knowing and understanding who he is, that he is your identity. I'm not John Romero, this Hispanic dude from Santa Fe. I'm John Romero, the, uh, the son of the, the, the son of the great king, man. I'm not this brown dude. I'm not identified by my race, by my skin. I'm identifying by who I am in Christ. This is what makes this dispensation so incredible and so amazing. Is there's no other period like it when God could care less about your color, your physicality, anything. You are a child of the King, man. You are a child of God. You have now, you have now owned His image. Romans 8. You are you have the power, be, not be your own power, his power, the Holy Spirit, to be Christ-like. You hear me say this all the time, right? There's three three phases to the journey, right? Phase one, the cross. That is when God separated us, you and me, from the penalty of sin. Did you catch that? What was the penalty? Eternal separation from God, death. That last part of this timeline. That's eternal death. The Bible calls it the second death. He separated you from the penalty of sin at the cross. In this life, he separates you from what? The power of sin. Sin has no power over you. It only has power over you if what? Yeah. If you allow it. Right. Free will. It's your free will. So the, it begs the question, are you allowing God, and this is key, this is really important, are you allowing God to transform you? Because that's how you become Christ-like, right? Romans 12, verse 3. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body is a living sacrifice. You have to be willing to commit to his purpose, to his mission. And then he goes on. In verse number three, when he says, and he says, and be ye not conformed to this world. Don't let this world define you, is what Paul is saying. You are not a brown dude from Santa Fe. You are not a black man from wherever. You, you're, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be not politically correct. I don't know what the word is, but you know what? All lives matter to God, frankly. They do. That said, from a biblical, spiritual perspective, when you think like that, it's not about what you or who you think you are. It's who you are in Christ. Because now you have the power. You have the power. And God separates you from the power of this identity politics and all the other stuff that hinders us from becoming Christ-like. 
And then at the rapture, or the day that you die and you're standing before him, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Guess what? Now you're separated from the presence of sin eternally. Because now you're with him. Penalty, power, presence. And you know what's going to happen at the rapture? Your likeness is going to match up to with your... What word am I looking for? Your likeness will match up to your what? Who said image? Good job, Sylvia. To your image. Now you're whole again. Now you're exactly where Adam and Eve were in Genesis chapter 1 when they were created in the image and in the likeness of God. Guess what this body is going to be called? A glorified body. I was talking to my mom today about that someday. Man, it's going to be good. No more knee surgeries. No more back pain. No more stub toes. Be able to go on a hike. We'll be able to climb Everest. You and I, Clyde, and come back and not be hurting, not worry about all the ibuprofen, just so that we can... No oxygen. No oxygen. <laughs> yes. Um, question from Steve. Yeah, just a question from Steve. Did Solomon write Proverbs in the condition of being a type of Christ or being a type of Antichrist or maybe both? He would have written it during the type of Christ, and I'll tell you why, because he wrote Proverbs during Second you Second Kings. The question? Yes, oh, I'm sorry. The question is, did Solomon write Proverbs when he was a type of Christ or a type of Antichrist? Here's what I will say. God allowed Solomon to experience anything and everything that he desired. You see that in the book of Ecclesiastes. That's why I love Ecclesiastes so much. It speaks so profoundly about origin, meaning, destiny. But when he wrote Proverbs, he wrote it when he was a type of Christ. How do we know that? He wrote the Proverbs in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 23, somewhere around there, where he talked about Solomon writing 3,000 Proverbs. But you know what, God, because of the wisdom that God gave him to write Proverbs, he understood this truth. He understood the issue of he understood the issue of the depravity of man. He understood the issue of the human condition, of original sin, of what we inherited from Adam. So that leads us to the second part of his question, if you will. How can wickedness be very good? Again, keep it in context. Keep it in perspective. The wickedness did show up till after what? After the fall. When they moved from innocence to conscience. When they finally were able to embrace. And again, that's why it's called what it's called. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Could you imagine what they were able to now see? And at that instant, at that point, history changes forever. Now, if you go into Genesis chapter 6, looking at your timeline again, and the very next dispensation, which is the human government one, and you know how God has to end that conscience one over here? How does he end conscience? Genesis chapter 6. He ends it with the flood. Why? If you go to Genesis chapter 6, Things got really bizarre, really crazy. Flip over to ch chapter 6. Let me just read a couple of thoughts to you out of that chapter. Verse 1. And it came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. We won't even get into the whole sons of God thing. And the Lord God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, for his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same being mighty men, which are of old, men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And listen to this, folks. Catch this. And every imagination... Of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil continually. That's how crazy and how bizarre and how bad God things got in Genesis chapter 6, right before the flood. 
the human condition, the depravity of man. And you know what really exacerbated and compounded the ugliness and the wickedness and the evil in these days? The fallen angels show up and they take on physical bodies and they start to have children. The word giant, the Hebrew word is the Nephilim. Study the Nephilim out there and who they were and what, where they show up in scripture. So when the children of Israel are finally liberated from Egypt, when they finally depart from Egypt, Marvin? Yeah, that's your left hand, bro. Right hand, okay. Don't confuse me, because I was doing this. Okay. Yes. Could we hold on to that thought? Why don't we why don't we answer that cat question later on? But I'll throw this buzzword out there, transhumanism. Okay? I'll leave you with that thought. Because that's like a major rabbit trail to do it right. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. But I'll throw the word transhumanism out there and you guys could just uh, it's it's starting to raise its ugly head again. You know why it's you know why it's showing up now? The whole concept and the whole theme of transhumanism to answer your question? Because Jesus warned that in the last days before his return, before the rapture, you know what he says in verse number 35 of Matthew 24? As it was in the what? In the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of Son of Man. <laughs> History's going to repeat itself. You're going to see some crazy stuff going on on the planet. It already is. It already is. With that said, we're there, man. We're there. There's some other things that still need to play out, guaranteed. Um, uh, I think a more overt manifestation of of the uh, sons of God, right? And again, don't confuse sons of God with the New Testament sons of God. Are you seeing how the Word of God connects the dots? Maybe? Ollie, don't look at me like that. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. I know I am crazy. I know she's pondering. She's thinking. Yeah. So, so, getting back to the last verse in Proverbs, if you guys want to turn to Proverbs 16.4. Uh, no, you don't have to turn to, turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. That's where we were. I want to leave you this. This is the final thought. We might end Bible study a little tonight unless we want to do a follow up here and there uh, relative to tonight's subject because Marvin's question is pretty pretty deep pretty in depth actually if we if we do it right um, where did I tell you to go? Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah 17. <clears throat> principle one of Bible study right? principle number one and two as you apply this principle who can share with me the context of the book of Jeremiah? anybody know? say that again? He's referred to as the weeping prophet. Why is he called the weeping prophet? Anybody know? By the way, he's also the guy that writes lamentations. In other words, he's lamenting over what he's witnessing, man. You know what? I, my heart breaks for what I'm for what I see going on in this country. It really does. I don't think I've gone to the extreme, perhaps, that Jeremiah has in terms of weeping. I don't necessarily weep for this country, but I weep for souls. You know, I weep for the people that I love, that I care for, that don't know the Lord. That will see, here's the phrase, mark it down, that will witness the day of evil. Because it begs the question, what's the day of evil? Again, the Bible always interprets itself. And again, a simple word study, a simple phrase study of the phrase day of evil. It only shows up three times in scripture. It shows up in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4. And right here in Jeremiah chapter 17. And Jeremiah is a prophet that is warning God's people about coming, about coming destruction. They're coming. The Babylonians are going to be here. 
And that's kind of how I feel sometimes. It's like a, man, get ready, church. Get ready because it's happening. It's coming. The kingdom of Antichrist is real. The Bible's very explicit, very clear. We're seeing, we're seeing these super signs like never before. Not that I'm encouraging you that you look and follow signs, but in context, Jeremiah is warning God's people, the nation of Israel, about impending doom if they don't get their act together. That's the gist of the whole thing. Some twenty-three, some thirteen chapters later, in chapter number thirty, is where you find the phrase. Jacob's trouble and the whole concept and the whole theme of the tribulation period. In chapter 29, you see them ending up in um, in Babylon, right? And people always quote verse number 11 that God has a plan for you. And he, have you seen those placards on people's desks with Jeremiah 29, 11? You know what they don't read is the first 10 verses. There are somewhat verses of hope because God is saying to the children of Israel in Jeremiah chapter number 29 that, man, you guys are going to find yourself in a pretty dark place in a really bizarre time. Does that sound familiar? But you know what he says to them in the first five, six verses of Jeremiah 29? You keep planting gardens. You keep having children. You keep doing what I called you to do. That's my hope and prayer for our church. Stay true to the mission. The souls of men and women are all that matter at this stage. We're in the chain dispensation of grace. And I know we're being inundated with craziness, with circumstances, with all this stuff happening on the planet and the world. And, you know, we've been seeing it and we're seeing it again play out. I think things are going to get worse. And I think we know, I know where things are going to get worse. So how will we respond? God tells Jeremiah, you keep doing what I called you to do. So in Jeremiah 17, you see the phrase, day of evil show up. Is there a question? I'll, or? I'll ask a question after you read Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah 17. Look at verse number 9. For the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Wow. He's talking about the human condition. You know how you change the heart? Anybody have any idea? You know how you change someone's heart? You change their mind. It's called repentance. How do we know? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. You know where the battle starts? In your head. Your perception of yourself. How you think about who God is. What you do with your thoughts every single day. And uh, there was somebody I was dealing with last week. We were sitting in this room on a Sunday afternoon. They didn't come to church because of fear. Because of fe the, 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 they're just inundated with fear. And I said, you don't have to tell me why you're experiencing all this fear. I know where your focus is. Tell me if I'm not wrong. I said, are you just watching news and on the online, watching all this stuff that's happening? And the world goes, yeah, that's my world. I said, there you go. You know what these things are called? They're called gates. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and the king of glory shall come in. Psalms chapter 24. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and the king of glory will come in. Who is the king of glory? You know what? We're not glorifying God with our gates. So our gates are what I'm reading, what I'm meditating on, what I'm studying, what I'm focusing on, how I'm praying. This is how you're going to change the way you think. And you know what your thinking is going to do? It's going to affect your heart. Who you are intellectually, your mind. This is the strongest part of who you are as a being. There's three parts to the soul. I don't know if you know that or not. The mind, who you are intellectually. The heart, who you are emotionally. And the will. So did you catch that? These better be in check. These better be balanced. Because these, the mind and the heart will affect the choices that you make in life. The will. So, if you get so focus on all the craziness in the world and that becomes your life and that becomes your crazy world, your chaotic world. There is no way that you're able to pray. And that's what I said to this young couple. I said, I bet you're not even praying. Huh? She goes, man, I can't even tell you the last time I prayed. Why? Because my mind's so 
inundated and so saturated with all that's going on. I'm fearful for my children. I'm fearful for my family. See how Satan works. You know what he did? He cast doubt. He planted seeds of doubt in her mind and deceived her that there's no hope. Which resulted in what? Separation. Death. Not, not spiritually. That doesn't mean she's lost her salvation. She's separated spiritually and that affects you. And when you're feeling that separation, what are you feeling now? Shame, blame, and fear. Fear. God never was about fear. Because when we're intimate with Him, right? When we're so connected with Him, you're experiencing His love and His comfort and His embrace each and every day. And you know what you're going to find in that? Security. Something that we're all going to need in these crazy, bizarre, and nutty times that we're finding ourselves in. That's why Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, remember before he talks to him about being a student of God's word? What did he say in verse 7? God didn't give you what? Spirit of here, but of what? Power. power. Well, it's the power for a thing. His spirit. God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and of, listen to this one, love. Love. You know what? He's talking about who you are emotionally, who you are at the heart level. And then what he says next? In a sound mind. Are you seeing the connection? In Philippians chapter 4, when he's talking about overcoming anxiety and overcoming all this craziness and fear, he says, be careful for nothing but, in, but through prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And he goes on, he says next, in verse number 7, he says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding will keep your what? Your hearts and your minds. See the connection. So see the distinction, but the connection. He'll keep your heart and your mind. What? Where? In a safe? Where does he keep it? What's the word keep mean? Protect. He's going to protect your heart and your mind. That's a promise. Where? How is he going to protect it? Read the rest of the verse. Or quote the rest of the verse. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. He's the key, man. He is the source. In finding the peace that we desperate. In overcoming the craziness. This is why I love these Old Testament prophets. This is why I'm looking forward. Someday we'll get back to the minor prophets. Because they were hardcore, man. They were all about the mission. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17. Look at verse number... I don't know. 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Man, he's really driving home the deliverance of Israel from the coming persecution by Nebuchadnezzar. Look at your page 19 again. Where does Nebuchadnezzar show up in the list? He's a type of antichrist. Are you getting the pictures here? So guess what? We're on the cusp of seeing this antichrist show up. You know what Paul refers to him in 2 Thessalonians 2? The lawless one. The son of perdition. Look at the world today. What's the agenda today? Defund what? Somebody talk to me. Yeah. You know, what they're, you know what they're really saying? Chaos. Bring on the chaos. Bring on the lawlessness. That's really the agenda. You need to know that. You better understand that. This is about lawlessness. We are so there. We saw what happened in Seattle with, that, with the Chaz, this autonomous zone. We know what happened in the autonomous zone. People started getting raped. People started getting killed. No cops around to enforce. That's what they wanted. You know what you're seeing? The heart is desperately wicked and who can know it? The human condition. And here they don't need anybody. We all just govern ourselves. And what did the mayor call it? This is going to be a summer of love. That's what she called it. This is going to be the new Woodstock. Really? Well, I saw a reporter go into the autonomous zone and he started talking about 
wow, this is going to be this. He was echoing the mayor's words. This is going to be a summer of love. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Everything's going to be good. This guy says, you need to just shut up. It ain't about no summer of love. We're here to rock this world. It's called anarchy. It's called Antifa. It's called an agenda. Chaos. Why chaos? Why do things get to get nuts and crazy? So the Antichrist could show up. And you know when God's going to deal with him? Look at the rest of this story. Verse 16 is for me. I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Verse 17. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Look at verse 18. Let them be confounded that persecute me. But let not be confounded. What is Jeremiah a type of? You think? Israel in the tribulation period. Where they're going to be persecuted. Where they're going to be looking at confounded. Who's going to be doing that? This Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, who is a type of what? You see the pictures? Watch this. But let not be dismayed. Bring upon them the what? The day of evil. And destroy them with double destruction. Who's them? All the craziness. All the nuttiness that's going, going to go on in those seven years. Things are getting crazy. When does it get dealt with? When is that day of evil? Anybody have any idea? What is a reference to the day of evil? You want to see an interesting verse? Turn to, turn to Amos chapter number five. One of your minor prophets. This is a second coming context. A second coming verse. Look at uh, Amos chapter 5. <clears throat> Look at verse number 18. Woe unto you. Wow, that word woe. Remember what we said, to def what it meant when we were doing our study in the book of Revelation? What does it mean in Spanish? Ay. Ay. Woe. I Remember the three woes? I, I, I. I, Amos is saying, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? For the day of the Lord is darkness and what? And not light. Anybody know when the day of the Lord is? Phrase study, principle number 12. When's the day of the Lord? Say it again. Good job, Ollie. Right here, man. You know what he's saying? You better watch out, world. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to come back with a vengeance. No longer is he going to come back with like a little baby a, as a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion. Go read Revelation 19. Wait till we get into the minor prophets again. Wait till you see Joel chapter 2. The gloves are coming off. And he's going to, de he's going to deal, and this is to answer your question, Steve, he's going to deal with the day of evil once and for all, man. The Antichrist has had his time on this earth and all those that chose to follow him and all the depravity and all the craziness. This is why when the vials show up in the book of Revelation chapter number 16, when those vials show up, it's not called wrath or tribulation or whatever. You know what it's called? The day of God's wrath. It's God's wrath. He's going to take the gloves off. And he's going to deal with the day on that day once and for all. That's the day of evil. It has nothing to do with it being very good. Again, getting back to your question, Steve, that whole Genesis 139 where everything was very good was way before the depravity of man showed up, before the fallen nature, the human condition shows up in the book of Genesis. Is there a question, Larry? Yes, Steve again. 
Um, God instilled wickedness in Pharaoh's heart for his purpose. Could this be the context of good so as to accomplish his plan with the Israelites? Always. Never forget, the question is, God instilled wickedness in Pharaoh's heart. The Bible did not say that it instilled wickedness. The Bible says that it hardened his heart. So there's a difference. He was already wicked, right? We know that. Look at your list again. Look at your tribulation, I mean your tribulation period list. Look at your uh, types of Christ Antichrist list on page 19. Who else shows up on the Antichrist list? Pharaoh. So he's already a type of the Antichrist. So God is sovereign. And what you can't lose sight of, you cannot lose sight of this plan that God has orchestrated. There's, a, there's an attribute of God that we need to be mindful of. It's called his foreknowledge. He knows and he, he knows, he knew that you would get saved. Although he gave you the, cho the choice to get saved. It's just one of these, it's called a paradox. And although he knew you got saved, he knew that you were going to get saved, Right? Don't confuse that with predestination. Like a Calvinist believes and teaches in, in the fact that God has preordained or predestined believers. No. The word predestination always is in the use is in the use of the context. If you look at both Ephesians chapter one and in Romans chapter number eight, the context of predestination always reveals to us what God predestined was that you be conformed into the image of Christ. That's what he predestined. That was his plan from the beginning. Is that Marie, that John, that that Donna, that Sylvia, that we all become Christ-like. That's his point. Because you know what? You are going to become Christ-like. You are going to get his image. You do have his image when you get saved. And one of these days, you're going to get his likeness. That's what he predestined. He predestined us to be conformed in the image of Christ. But he knew. Why? Because he's God. He put this plan out. You know what? Job is the greatest example and the greatest revelator, revelation book, I think, if you will, that even Lucifer is bound to God's plan. Here's my servant Job. Have at him. But you can't kill him. God's in control. That's what sovereignty means. He's on the throne. This is his plan. This is his agenda. The issue is, are you aligning with it? Are we aligning with it? That's the issue. This is why you have to know him, his, his attributes, his makeup, how he thinks, and then understand and embrace his plan. This is why we are adamant about throwing this up every single Wednesday night. Every chance we get is really impart to you the importance of, look at what this is called, this chart. God's plan for the ages. All right, Roberta. Yeah, my husband and I were discussing the return of our Lord, and he was saying, "Why didn't the Lord?" Similar things were happening in the time of Martin Luther, uh -huh. and yet the Lord didn't return then. So why would you think He's going to be returning so soon, Roberta? Because we were talking about sure. that. Sure. We're talking about the signs of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a question; it's just a comment. You know, like, yeah. Like he he's saying that something is going to happen in his lifetime. And I'm saying, I don't know, because I'm not God, but, you know, looking at the events of our world, I'm thinking that the Lord is around the corner. That's all I'm saying. Okay, cool. So, Roberta makes the comment, because, I mean, this is in line with some of our discussion tonight, is how do we know that it's going to happen or not? Why are we so adamant or whatever? Um, I use one term that I've never used before because of what I see playing out in the... Yeah. Uh, and I, I think I've shared with you my testimony. The thing that brought me to the Lord, and I'm grateful for this, was my fascination with biblical prophecy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was given a book when I was still a lost dude um, called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Yes. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book, but that was my first real exposure to any kind of uh, evangelism kind of Christianity. And I remember reading about the rapture. And I said, how absurd is that? How stupid is that? I kind of thought like that. You know what? Who could ever believe in some kind of event like the rapture? Mm -hmm. Right? So, never before have we had the privilege of witnessing what I consider. And again, I have never set dates. I do not set dates. No. Never can, never will. No. 
But here's what I will tell you, and this I think goes in line with the question or the or the question about why now? One word: convergence. Convergence, convergence of what? Convergence of all these events mm -hmm. happening together like never before. Mm -hmm. There's always been a glimpse here or a glimpse there. Probably, well, he was talking about, was he talking about the Protestant Reformation yes. when he talked about that? Yes. That was in 1570. I don't know why they would have thought that the coming of the Lord, but here's what I will tell you. First Thessalonians chapter number four and chapter number five, the whole book letter to the Thessalonians was written to a church who believed that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. I'm talking 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's why he wrote the book. That's why you find the rapture in chapters 4 and chapters 5. Mm -hmm. Believers have always been waiting for the return for him in the church, right? This is the, the ketubah, the bride, waiting for the trumpet sound so we could go be with our Lord. Paul calls it in Titus chapter 2, verse number 13, the blessed hope. That's what keeps me motivated was this, this hope, this expectation that today may be the day. That motivates me, man, to stay in his word, to, to stay connected, to, to stay where I need to be in my right mind and knowing who he is and what his plan is about. But I'm also not oblivious to the signs, the convergence of signs like we've never seen before. And the one sign that is really relevant to today that never existed, the one super sign, I call it, is the restoration of the nation of Israel in 1948. That is mind-blowing. That was unheard of. And the reason why we have cults, the reason why we have religions, is because everybody thought that they were the new Israelites until 1948. And they said, wow, what now? And you know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 20, chapter number 32 in the parable of the fig tree? That the generation that gets to see the fig tree bo birth or born or bear fruit mm -hmm. will be the generation that sees these events happen. Everything that he laid out in the entire book of Matthew 24. That is the super sign. I see Turkey and Iran and Russia <coughs> Right now, sitting on the border of the, of the northern part of Israel, in the Golan. Mm -hmm. I used to travel to Turkey in the mid-80s, late 80s, for my job. I used to go to Inzerlik, to an Air Force base there. And I, be, I, I, mean, befriend, I befriended this guy named Ali. He was a, my taxi driver that I would pay extra money, and he would take me sightseeing. And he, I never forgot how much he would share with me every time we would link up because he would look, come looking for me and, or I would tell him when I would be coming back how much he hated as a Turk how much he despised the Russians he hated absolutely hated the Russians the Turks generally mm -hmm. who would have thought that 30 some years later they'd be buddies they'd be friends they'd be allies in preparation for a biblical war mentioned in scripture in Ezekiel 38 with those three countries specifically Russia, Turkey and Iran mm -hmm. coincidence? I don't think so the Turks they're no longer buying F-16s and F-17s and F-22s from the United States you know what they're buying now? Russian MiGs mm. Ezekiel 38, chaos, uncertainty, all these events, man, like never before. We're living, I just dig it, in exciting times. I hate the controls that are being imposed on us as an American because we're all about that, freedom. But I'm also not naive or oblivious or ignorant to the fact that we are living in some times that I don't think anybody in this room ever thought we could live in. You can't go one verse. You can't go one verse in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 6, without the virus being mentioned when he starts talking about signs. It's called what? Pestilence. And famines. And wars. And rumors of wars. Nation will war against nation. This whole thing that we see going on in this country, 
is a nation against nation war. You know what that means? It means it's ethnic. That's what the word nation means. It's a racial war. And then he draws a distinction between nations and what? Kingdoms. Check it out. Matthew 24, verse 6. And what Jesus says next, all this stuff happening, let no man what? Deceive you. That's why we need to stay true to what we need to be doing. Knowing and believing and just seeing people saved. Because if it doesn't happen, let's say there's a verse in the book of Esther somewhere or in the book of Ruth. One little verse that throws this off by a thousand years. So what? I believe I'm going to be with him someday. Whether it's tomorrow, whether it's today. There's a doctrine that I believe in wholeheartedly. It's called imminence. The imminent return of Jesus Christ in the rapture. What does imminent mean? It will happen. It's whenever. It could happen right now. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen next week. It could happen a year, two years from now. You know what? That's the blessed hope. That's what motivates me. I just think we live in some crazy, nutty, bizarre, exciting times. And just like we sing that song on Sunday mornings every once in a while, I just want to be found ready. I just want to be found ready. I just want to be occupying, like Jesus says, when I leave, occupy till I come. What does that mean? Occupy the middle of Seattle? <laughs> occupy the plaza with signs of, no, man. <laughs> Stay busy about his work. Yeah. Stay busy about his mission. What does that mean? Seeing people saved? Yeah. Seeing people discipled? There are people in this room, man, that are gifted teachers and you could be and should be discipling others. Because I'll tell you what, I can't do it all. Can't do my plates full sometimes. As David Comas, he sits over, he gets frustrated with me because we're postponing, we're doing this. Can you meet here because I need my tire? You know what? Discipleship is on us. Second Timothy 2 2, right? 14 verses later, he talks about study. But he says this in verse 2. He says, All right, Timothy, my son, my beloved son, the things that you've heard of me commit to faithful men and women who shall be able to what? Teach others also. In other words, he's saying, man, this is our responsibility. It's really cool because here I see Marie. She's only known the Lord, what, two years, three years, two and a half years? A little over two years. And she's already discipling. Praise God. Well, Cindy Romero discipled Sylvia. Sylvia discipled Marie. Marie's discipling Ebony. And Sylvia's discipling you guys finished, didn't you, Michelle? See, you're ready. You are ready. You didn't quit messing around. And you retired as of Friday. Yes. Awesome. As of Congratulations. Hey, Danny, let's go to lunch, the four of us. You could buy. Awesome, man. I'm awesome. I didn't know that. She's retired. Can you not leave? Because I have some, I need to run something by you tonight before you head out. That is so cool. So that... No, not today. No. Look at the time, for gosh sakes. Wow. Five minutes? Ashes to ashes. Earth to earth. Is that enough? So. All right. So um, that, was, um, that was a good question, Steve. Um, I hope it answered your question. Just know that um, we are living like we talked about several weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, when we introduced that heavenly event about the, the book. Right now, there is a different king on this throne in this earth, right? We know him as the devil. We know him as Satan. Paul refers to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4, as the God of this world. You and I don't live in this world. You're just in this world. You're not of it. So you live at a whole other spiritual level. And that's what you can't lose sight of. You, because you do live in this world controlled by this entity, that he is the God of this world. He is, remember I likened it to him being a squatter. He's usurped that deed that God's going to, that Jesus is going to take back. The deed for this planet. When he gets that back, then everything will be where and how God designed it. Right? At the kingdom and then ultimately in eternity. So, I hope it's all making sense to everybody. Right? The uh, day of evil.
is another phrase or another uh, term for um, the day of vengeance, the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, man, when the gloves come off. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for tonight, for your word, for your grace, your love, your mercy towards us, for your spirit, Lord, who is so incredible at revealing and teaching. We just love you, Lord, and thank you and praise you for who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, Lord. Oh, the answer, that's right. Are we offline yet or no? No, we're still on. Okay, what's the answer, Larry? What's Nancy's answer? Oh, it's physical intimacy. Say it again? Physical intimacy. Physical intimacy. Is that how she couched it? Yes. Okay. That's a good job, Nancy. It's uh, it's right, but I think next week, so I'm going to leave everybody hanging so you could come back. <laughs> we'll not, be, a, we'll be, oh yeah, two weeks. You guys are going to have to wait two weeks. We'll give you exactly what happened, okay? Exactly what that physical intimacy was about. Um, but go check it out yourselves. Give Nancy a hug. Okay. Good job, Nancy. Yes, it, it is about that. Was it a uh, family member? Yes. Tish asked, is it about, was it family members? Yes. And what's the old game that we used to play when we were kids? Colder, hotter, warmer, warmer. <laughs> Warm. Which family member? Which family member? Father, daughter, daughter, daughter son. Yeah. The text will tell you. All right. All right, everyone. We're dismissed. Thank you for uh, your participation and great involvement. Great question. Um, again, Steve, let Larry know just so I could know that uh, your question got answered. Okay. Yeah, I did.